what does Peter do next? That's what we're going to find out in X3. So it says that Peter and John were going up to the temple in the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So if the sixth hour is the zero hour, the ninth hour would be 3 p.m. And so they're going up to the temple. And it said that there was a man who had been lame from birth. And he sat at this gate, which is the Jaffa gate, the beautiful gate. That's what Jaffa gate means every day asking for money. Now, the Jaffa gate was my favorite gate in all of Jerusalem and primarily because it led to Jaffa Street. And Jaffa Street, just down the block from the Jaffa Gate, had a restaurant called The Chocolate Soup. And in there, you could get chocolate soup. I mean, where does that go wrong? But it was an amazing gate, and it was where people came in and out. And so that means that Jesus walked in and out of this gate probably all the time. And everybody walks in and out of the gate, including the temple structure. They saw him every day. And it said something kind of interesting because it said that seeing Peter and John go into the temple, because, you know, the best time to ask for money probably is when someone's going to go in and go to a religious service because they're probably feeling more charitable, more of an obligation to give to the poor. It says Peter directed his gaze at him. Now, if you've ever been in a place like New York or Los Angeles where there are a lot of people begging for money, People will get what they call the 3,000-foot stare. Someone told me that I have to learn the 3,000-foot stare, which means that you are just looking down the street because as soon as you lock eyes with someone who's begging, they expect that you're going to give them some money. So the 3,000-foot stare. Instead, Peter gazed right at him. So did John and said to this beggar, look at us. So the beggar looked at his attention thinking, oh, I'm going to get some money right now. And Peter says, you know what? I don't have silver. I don't have gold. But what I can give you, I'm going to give you. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took the man by his right hand, raised him up. And immediately it says his ankles were strong and he could walk. The man was leaping. He was happy. He was joyful and entered the temple with them. And when they saw him leaping and praising God, And people said, hey, wasn't that that guy over at the gate who's been lame since birth? People were amazed at this. Now, I have to imagine, you know, that the temple structure would be depressed at this point because they probably thought this whole thing was really a John the Baptist and a Jesus thing. Now those two guys are gone. This is over with. We we can put an end to all this kerfuffle about this risen Lord and the Messiah and this new covenant, we can be done with this. But instead, what happening? People are still getting healed. People are still confessing Jesus' name. But it's also interesting to note that Peter did not claim to heal this man. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he gave all credit to Jesus for this healing. And it was instant. It was right there. Peter was convicted of this. So I think the Holy Spirit told him this is going to happen because I don't know that many of us, if we went and did this, we would feel all that convicted anything would happen. But Peter knew, you know, so obviously Peter understood and knew what was going to happen next. And so because it was the hour prayer meant everyone was going to temple, it was temple time, they all saw him. So when Peter saw this, he says, men of Israel, Why does it surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if this is by our own power? You know, that we made this man walk. We did not make this man walk. The healing took place through God's power. This is through the Savior. Why are you so shocked at this? Imagine this, that just 50 days ago, they were seeing Jesus doing this on a daily basis all over the place. They saw this happen. And so then he invokes, he says, you know what? This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. Peter, being a Jewish man, glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. And you decided, even though Pilate wanted to let him go, you disowned the holy and righteous one. You asked 
that a murderer be released and you killed the author of life. The author of life, remember, there from the very beginning, this is not just some second phase. This isn't some kind of prophet that just was walking among us. The author of life. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Wow. Again, another bold statement and invoking what the people going to temple would understand. This, this isn't a new thing. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And like I said, temple, that's what we hear all the time, that we pray to the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. It, it's just a standard thing that you know when you're a Jewish person. This would have meant something big to them. And again, I think when he's saying you put the author of life to death, it's very literally these people. But again, we are all the people who put Jesus' life to death because of our sin. And so he continues on that by the faith in Jesus Christ, you see this man was now made strong and he's walking again and the faith comes through him. You can see him completely healed. So I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leader. You didn't know. You didn't understand. And Jesus talked about that. Like, if you have ears here, if you have a brain, understand this. But they rejected it. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to see it. They rejected what was being said. But Peter is saying, you know what? I get it. You were ignorant. So were your leaders. But what God has fulfilled, he foretold through the prophets, that the Christ would suffer. Again, people thought, The scripture was talking about a triumphant Messiah. They missed all the Isaiah stuff about the suffering servant. So he is saying, you missed that, the whole fact that the Messiah would suffer. And he did because of your ignorance. So repent, which literally means turn around, turn back, think again. It says, then turn to God. So turn around, undo what you're doing, and turn towards God so that your sins may be wiped out. This is all ESV, by the way. Because the time of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send so that your sins can be blotted out, so you can be refreshed and relieved from your sins. And now Jesus has been received in heaven until the time of the restoring of all things. This is going to be the end time. The wheat and the chaff. The, the gate is narrow. That time is coming. But until then, Jesus is going to be there in heaven with God. Spoke by the prophets of long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up a prophet. So now he's quoting Moses. Like me, from your brothers, you shall listen to him. Do whatever he tells you to do. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to this prophet shall be destroyed from his people. This is Moses saying it. All the prophets have said this. We've talked about Zechariah and Isaiah and Joel and all the places where the Messiah was foretold. Samuel, all of them proclaimed this day. You are the sons of these prophets and the covenant of God was made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, near offspring shall be the families of earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you to, be, to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Wow. So again, a bold Peter quoting prophets, quoting the Old Testament, and quoting what Moses and Abraham said. And that ends chapter three. Boy, what I'm going to meditate on, again, is this idea that this is fulfillment. This isn't something new that we knew, not we, we, because we weren't alive, but all through time, this was foretold. This was supposed to happen, that Jesus was going to refresh us, forgive us of our sins, protect us from going to Hades. He was going to be there to do these things for us. And looking at this Peter again, who was afraid of a little girl in a courtyard, is now in the temple telling them what for, telling them how Jesus died for them and what is expected of them giving them the acknowledgement, you know what, you were ignorant, but now there's no excuse. What I'm going to pray about is that I can have this kind of boldness too. I 
want to be more bold. I will talk about God and I do talk about God, but sometimes you feel a little hesitant. You feel a little sheepish about the whole thing. To have this kind of boldness Peter has, that would be amazing. That's what I pray for. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that even if you rejected Jesus in the past, out of ignorance, you did the wrong thing, you said the wrong things, you ignored the right things, all that can be forgiven because Jesus comes to everybody who asks for it. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast. I hope this has been great for you. I'm really excited that we're getting into this opportunity to see what happens with the church next and how it's about to grow and form itself after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. Again, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Hope you're reading along. And so if you have other opinions and other thoughts, let me know. I'd love to hear what you think. Have a great day.